You all have heard many times about quantum gravity, we are going to jump something far from this. Before we start a basic overview of string theory, is that this theory proposes that the fundamental particles we observe, like electrons and quarks, are not point-like dots but rather tiny, vibrating strings. These strings exist in a higher dimensional space-time, and their vibrations give rise to the gravitational field. What makes string theory unique is that it doesn't merely try to merge quantum mechanics with general relativity. Instead, it aims to unify all fundamental forces in the universe by interpreting them as different vibrational modes of these strings. Unlike string theory, loop quantum gravity focuses more on the structure of space-time itself. It uses a special formulation of general relativity known as Ashtakar variables to propose a discrete granular structure of space-time. But the quest for quantum gravity doesn't stop there. There are other intriguing theories like quadratic gravity that modifies Einstein's equations by adding higher order terms, while classical gravity suggests that gravity remains fundamentally classical even at quantum scales. Another interesting approach posits that gravity becomes well-behaved at high energies, avoiding the infinities that plague other theories. For instance, Fermi's theory, which explains the weak force behind radioactive decay, couldn't be correctly quantized because it wasn't renormalizable. It broke down at a certain energy scale and had to merge with electromagnetism to form the electroweak theory. Theoretical particle physicists believe that at some very high energy level, all fundamental forces should merge into a single theory, known as the grand unification energy. However, gravity, unlike other forces, is not just a force but a theory of space and time. If you try to make an analogy between Fermi's theory and gravity, you quickly run into problems when you approach small scales. The Planck length is the smallest measurable distance because any smaller distance, if energy existed at that wavelength, would form a black hole. It is so small that if an atom were the size of the Earth, the Planck length would be smaller than an atom. We have never come close to detecting anything at this scale. The problem with forming black holes at the Planck length scale is that it doesn't stop there. Einstein's theory interacts with itself so strongly at these scales that it runs away generating nonsense results that are insurmountable. In other words, we can't discount physics going on below the Planck length because we can't get the theory to behave nicely at that scale, for example, becoming a non-interacting theory. Einstein's physics never stops interacting with decreasing scale, so smaller scales, such as those below the Planck scale, can't be thrown out to force the theory to make sense. All other theories stop changing with scale at some point called a conformal UV fixed point. As far as we know, Einstein's relativity has no such point, although it does have a conformal fixed point at large scales called a conformal IR fixed point. In other words, Einstein's theory stops interacting with itself at very large scales. This makes Einstein's relativity an ill-defined quantum field theory, or half ill-defined, since it has the one required fixed point at cosmic scales, but lacks the other one. All well-defined quantum field theories that explain electromagnetism and the behavior of atoms, quarks, and so on, have two fixed points, one at the scale of the very large and one at the scale of the very small. The theories run between these two scale points, perturbing them but ultimately running back to them. If Einstein's relativity were an approximation that only works at large scales, and some other theory explains what's going on at small scales, then we could solve this problem. If this were the case, we would call Einstein's an effective field theory because it is effectively true at large scales even though it breaks down at small. If we go by the other forces, gravity should be a perturbation of a conformal field theory, not just curved space-time at the Planck length, and this would make it radically different at small scales from the theory we know. A conformal field theoretic gravity only appears, however, when you take a specific kind of solution of the Einstein field equations called an anti-de Sitter spacetime and project it onto a hypersurface in one less dimension. This is called the ADS CFT correspondence. Despite the jargon in the previous paragraph, it isn't that complicated a concept, at least to picture in the usual three dimensions if you've ever seen a hologram, especially if you've made one with lasers and holographic film. Holography is the idea that all the information in a space is contained in a lower dimensional surface and projected into that space. Holograms do exactly this by encoding enough information about light, color, intensity, and, most importantly, direction and projecting it from a two-dimensional plate or film into a three-dimensional space. 
The projection of the image, although originating from a two-dimensional film, creates the appearance of a three-dimensional object. The ADS CFT correspondence is an example of holography or the holographic principle because it says that all the information in a quantum theory in an ADS space can be encoded by a conformal field theory, meaning a scale invariant one in one less dimension. What does that really mean? Well, it means that you can relate a theory of quantum gravity to a conformal quantum field theory in one less dimension, which is an interesting and useful result. It says that you don't have to worry about quantum gravity in the world in which we live, where it might not make sense as a quantum field theory because it only has to make sense as a conformal field theory on some potentially infinitely distant boundary. But that doesn't solve the fundamental problem because our theory is incomplete. All ADAS CFT tells us is that any complete theory of quantum gravity on an ADS will be precisely a CFT. It also works in the other direction so that by studying CFTs and making general statements about them, we can say things about all possible theories of quantum gravity. Unfortunately, it does not tell us what that theory is, and we know, because our universe's expansion is accelerating, that ours has a positive cosmological constant, so-called dark energy. Our universe seems to be de-sitter, not anti-de-sitter. A de-sitter space can be thought of as a hypersurface embedded in a space with one time and several space dimensions. While some particle theorists would like gravity to somehow flip from ADS to DS at a particular length scale, neatly solving the problem, others have attempted to build the ds cft correspondence with mixed results. The ds cft correspondence has, unfortunately, run into some problems. One is that quantum field theories on DS spaces are subject to bubble nucleation, meaning that the vacuum is unstable and forms bubbles of true vacuum, which may threaten the existence of a correspondence to CFTs on the boundary. Let's turn our gaze to one of the most fascinating and paradoxical concepts is the holographic principle and its relation to black hole thermodynamics. One of the most famous formulas in physics, attributed to Stephen Hawking and Jacob Bekenstein, states that the entropy of a black hole is proportional to the surface area of its event horizon. Essentially, it means that all the information contained within a black hole grows in proportion to its surface area, not its volume. Imagine anything that falls into a black hole, contributing its entropy and information, only affects the black hole's surface area. This intriguing fact leads us to infer that the entire universe might be a hologram, projected from two dimensions into three. But what does this mean for quantum gravity? Think of it this way. If information is stored on surfaces instead of within volumes, then this includes the information stored in gravity itself, which shapes space and time. Conversely, everything in the universe can be represented as information and energy residing on its boundary. What exists within the universe, what physicists refer to as its bulk, contains only the information projected inward from the boundary, potentially from infinity, or more likely from a very large but finite horizon in our case. Consequently, we could define quantum gravity as a theory existing not within the universe but on its boundary, with degrees of freedom that also reside on the boundary. In this framework, Einstein's theory of general relativity emerges as an approximation. By employing the holographic principle, we can address one of the most notorious predictions in the annals of physics, the cosmological constant problem. This prediction suggested that the cosmological constant should be 120 orders of magnitude larger than what we observe. The prediction assumed that every point in space contains vacuum energy with Planck scale black holes popping into and out of existence everywhere. However, if information exists only on the universe's boundary, this problem is resolved. The boundary of the universe cannot hold as much information as the bulk interior, thus it cannot support all those tiny black holes and their associated information. One proposed boundary is the future horizon, which is not at infinity, but rather the farthest distance we will ever be able to observe in the expanding universe. There are indications that using the size of this horizon and the holographic principle, we can arrive at the observed value of the cosmological constant. Now we arrive at a crossroads of speculation and possibility. From the insights we've gathered so far, we can begin to sketch an outline of what the ultimate theory of quantum gravity might entail. First, it must be a conformal field theory to resolve or cut off physics below the Planck scale. This theory will likely be articulated through the ADS-CFT correspondence or its potential counterpart, the DS-CFT correspondence. 
The holographic principle will also play a pivotal role, suggesting that all the information in our universe could be encoded on a boundary, rather than within its volume. String theory, a prominent contender, fits neatly into this framework. It predicts multiple compact dimensions beyond our perception and aligns with these principles. Many of the pioneers of these concepts are unsurprisingly string theorists, yet string theory is not the only game in town. Loop quantum gravity has made strides in connecting itself to adsound CFT and the holographic principle. Meanwhile, theories like asymptotic safety challenge the notion of holography, proposing that gravity is a local quantum field theory operating within the bulk of space-time. But what if there exists another theory that elegantly unifies these principles without necessarily being a theory of everything? While none of these principles are mandatory for a theory of quantum gravity, their absence would be surprising. They are inferred from the well-established pillars of Einstein's theory and quantum field theory. In quantum mechanics, values such as position, momentum, energy, and spin are quantized, meaning they can only take on certain discrete values rather than any value. To picture this, imagine you are creating a picture with a box of 64 crayons. While it may sound like a lot of colors, you can't blend them. You are always limited to 64 discrete colors. Gravity, described by Einstein's theory of general relativity, is not like this. Instead, it is classical, with particles or objects taking whatever values they choose. In our example, classical colors are more like paint. They can be blended into an infinite range of colors, creating hues in between those found in your crayon box. There are other critical differences between these two theories. In quantum mechanics, the properties of particles are never certain. Instead, they are described by wave functions, which give only probabilistic values. In contrast, general relativity does not entertain this uncertainty, presenting a deterministic view of the universe. The standard model explains how three of the four fundamental forces of nature work, the electromagnetic force, the weak force, and the strong force. Each of these forces is mediated by a boson, a photon for the electromagnetic force, a W or Z boson for the weak force, and a gluon for the strong force. These bosons act as delivery particles, carrying forces between other particles. However, gravity stands apart. It is not known to have a particle that mediates its interactions, and searches for this particle, the hypothetical graviton, have so far been fruitless. Both general relativity and the standard model work extraordinarily well within their own domains and have withstood numerous tests. Yet their limitations become apparent in extreme environments like the centers of black holes or the first moments of the universe. For example, imagine a photon traveling through the universe. General relativity tells us this photon would follow a classical path that aligns with the curves and contours of space-time influenced by the gravity of planets, stars, and galaxies. Yet this photon also adheres to the rules of the electromagnetic force governed by quantum mechanics, and we don't know how to reconcile these laws within curved space-time. To truly grasp the universe, we need a way to unite these seemingly incompatible theories, and quantum gravity aims to do just that. Some approaches attempt to quantize gravity to make it compatible with quantum mechanics. Others modify quantum mechanics to align more closely with gravity. At the end, stay curious and remember we still don't know our universe.